is it is an honor and a, a a real pleasure to be with everyone today. I understand this is the culminating session from a fantastic day of Transmeet that culminates months and years of work and effort that came into pulling us all together and arriving at, at this moment. I hope everyone uh, will return to YouTube where I think the filmed uh, the content will be available in the future and tomorrow for the, for the final day of Transmeet. I wanna thank our hosts, the Transmeet Conference organizers uh, who are with us here, Tal, um, Tomer and Sharona. I want to thank uh, the uh, Steinhardt Museum of Natural History and the Bar Ilan and Tel Aviv universities who will be hosting the Tel Aviv lasers going forward. So welcome to the, the first laser of Tel Aviv. Laser of course is the Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous speaker series that connects with 47 hosted cities around the world uh, that, that, that uh, provide platform for this, this kind of speaking engagement. I'm uh, uh, pretty thrilled to be with you as uh, CEO of Leonardo and as a former resident of Tel Aviv. So I'm able to uh, reconnect with my old um, uh, hometown uh, and wanna wish everyone uh, around the world a good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We're in different time zones. And uh, in Israel, Erev Tov, to all and to Darba, Bruchim Chabaim, for everyone who has arrived, welcome. So I want to um, I suggest that we could imagine moving us toward uh, a new way of being. It's what we do in Leonardo as artists, science technologists. We imagine new ways of knowing, new ways of seeing, new ways of being together with ourselves and with each other. And that is what an ecology is. We are an ecology. We, this is how we organize ourselves in relation to each other and our environment. And what I invite us to consider in this laser is how we might move through the ecologies of arts, science, technology into an ecology, a creative ecology of courage. So that's what I'm going to um, bring us through tonight. I'm going to uh, uh, see if I can share my screen and uh, frame the conversation a little bit. And I can do it. Yes. And in present mode, here we go. Uh, now my colleagues and friends, you can see this okay? Okay. Um, all right, so uh, uh, Leonardo, the International Society of Art, Science and Technology is uh, uh, honored to have been wrestling with this wonderful messy, juicy intersection of art, science, technology uh, for over five decades, almost as old as I am, almost, but not quite. It's trying to catch up with me. And uh, in the process, we've really moved and evolved as an experimental creative ecology through an ecology of interdisciplinary knowledge shared through our publications uh, and expanded to embrace our ecology of practice and connectivity through our growing uh, suite of programs and our growing community and into what I hope to explore together with my colleagues today, uh, an ecology of courage. So first to understand what we mean by ecology. So ecology is how we organize ourselves in relation to each other and our environment. And we can think about ecology on four levels. The ecology of individual organism, of a group or population, of a field community or an ecosystem. On the first level, uh, uh, ecology is, is 
organizing individuals and organism. This is where Leonardo's pioneers and visionaries imagined uh, creating this, this kind of enterprise and intersection. And we're honored to have one of our founders and board members with us for this inaugural Tel Aviv laser culminating transmit uh, in, this, in this session. Sometimes we think of our individuals in the ecosystem, our ecology of Leonardo as misfits and masters and maestros. Misfits, masters, and maestros. I aspire to be any and all of those. At the second level of ecology, we are a group, a population, and Leonardo emerges as an organization. We uh, uh, now reach through our network uh, over a half a million people, 565,000 people download our content through Leonardo the publication and our related books and uh, uh, publishing through MIT Press. Uh, and our, our content through our publications and our programs now reaches people in 75 countries around the world. This is our uh, 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 group level of the, the ecology. Uh, that is Leonardo. At the third level, we have a field, a community, and our network of network that has uh, emerged, uh, including the intersection between the, the laser network that we're now part of uh, with this session here, uh, hosted in uh, Tel Aviv from Transmeet. And then finally, at the fourth level of ecology, we have an ecosystem. Now, an ecosystem is our interconnected network of networks. It's our creative economy. It is uh, the process or uh, flow of energy that sustains and regulates the environment. But our ecosystems only exist under different biomes. And those biomes are defined by climate. But we know that our climate, the environment in which we are creating across disciplines, across geographies, across languages today, our climate is changing. We know that this year, the, our systems have been uprooted and that opening allows us to reimagine what our ecology might be and might become. This is uh, the cover of the uh, most recent issue of Leonardo, which continuously inspires me with its beauty. Solzhenitsyn says that beauty may save the world. I'm trusting that. We know that uh, this opening offers a, a, a unique portal, a portal of new geometry, of a new sense of time, a new sense of touch and connectivity. This year has warped our sense of time. It has been uh, surreal, unreal, and hyperreal. I was inspired uh, recently to stumble across a Nigerian proverb that says the earth moves at different speeds depending on who you are. This year, we have all experienced the earth moving at a different speed. To embrace this uh, change uh, and uh, approach an ecology of courage, we want to think about what needs to be encouraged. And one of the things that can be encouraged is our evolution as an organization and as part of a larger movement in art, science, technology of offering full cycle creative engine, pulling together our creative practice, not as an isolated initiative, rather as a lifelong practice supported by lasers, publications, contemplation, our connectivity, our collaboration, our uh, content generation, and our critique of our full cycle creative life. This is a vibrant ecology. But to become an ecology of courage, we need to move through full cycles to be an inclusive and full circle. We need everyone to uh, be invited and to show up 
welcomed and encouraged and enabled. This is a time when we really need courage. Uh, we need to uh, not just have courage individually as we reimagine our world, but most importantly, collectively as an ecology in relation to each other and to our environment. When I speak of courage, I mean courage in the sense of the, the French word cour, of the heart. I don't mean courage in the sense of might and uh, the, the strength of, of um, uh, our, our, um, uh, our, our power, rather the, the, the power of our heart, the power of our spirit, the sense of um, not just heroic uh, military might, strength of gvura, but uh, the strength of spirit, ometz ruach. And uh, I, in that sense of considering ecology of courage that we might lead and we might learn from and we might live in, I am, am struck with the words of Stella Adler, who says that while life beats us down and crushes the soul, art reminds us that we have one. So I want to, um, with that, uh, uh, invite my um, co-conspirators uh, in imagining and building an ecology of courage from Leonardo to share some of their thoughts in where and how we find courage through art science technology, through the Leonardo network, through Leonardo's legacy, and through Leonardo's future. So I'm going to uh, uh, invite uh, Xin Wei to first introduce himself and uh, share some initial thoughts and we'll be uh, moving into conversation uh, with um, uh, uh, Roger and Xin Wei and myself uh, and we'll have some time for questions and answers from, uh, from the audience. Xin Wei, I'm so thrilled that you're on the Leonardo board leading us and uh, uh, leading me and joining us here today. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Diana. It's a, really a delight to be here with you all and also with my very esteemed colleagues, uh, Diana and Roger. So um, uh, we thought we would maybe go a little bit more round robin. So right now I'll keep my remarks more like introductory, but we'll come back again, all right? And show some maybe more examples of courageous work that we think of as courageous work but to kind of uh, at least introduce where I'm coming from, I'll say a little bit about, you know, kind of uh, why, you know, I or the people I work with, a couple hundred people now over the last uh, 20 years uh, are really dedicated to this idea, I think, of, of trying to enable, not to be courageous so much ourselves, that that is almost, you know, a Herculean task, but how to enable uh, others around us to be courageous with us. I think that's, there's, there's something there. So, I mean, you know, when Newton uh, did his famous experiment, right, that we all know from school, this history, he took white light and he put it through a prism and then split it into different colors. So I like to think of that as a kind of a, a standing for modern science where we divide and conquer. You know, we, we have all the different uh, sciences um, look with different uh, optics, so to speak, uh, on the world. Some people are coming from astronomy other people come from uh, molecular, molecular biology, et cetera, et cetera. And this kind of specialization is a source of strength. Absolutely, it's a source of strength. But this kind of divide and conquer technique we know now has its limits, okay? So, so there's another observation, which is that, you know, oftentimes when we're coming in from different areas, you know, as artists, as humanists, let's say philosophers, we're at downstream, what I call downstream from technology. That, you know, the people, who are inventing these new technologies uh, give us uh, these miraculous devices and instruments and we can use them or we can critique them. We can make uh, innovative uses of them. We can even be critical of them, but that's all later, it's a bit later. So can we actually have a more symmetrical relationship? Can we uh, be all present at the, at the origin of, uh, of, of novelty? 
whether it's a technological novelty, scientific novelty, artistic novelty, is that possible? That's not a new thing. This notion of the atelier was several centuries old, right? Comes back from an Eastern European tradition, comes back from the Middle Ages and before. It's kind of fusion of practices. So what are some questions we can, we can ask? You know, why would we want to do this? Okay, um, work that way. Here's a question I ask students uh, who've been working with us for many years and say, well, uh, uh, well what, can, what can an artist make, um, not as a statement, you know, you can be very clever, we can be very critical. Um, instead of making statements, can, can, can artists uh, enable play? Can artists enable others to ask questions that they would not have asked before, right? So, but the same thing goes for science. So can so that's why I use the word maker instead of artist. I can say when somebody who makes a machine, an engineer, somebody who makes uh, an aesthetic work, an artist, but it could also be somebody who makes a concept, a philosopher. So, so these are all makers. For us, they're all makers. Some people make ideas, fresh ideas. Some people can make fresh events, right? So if you combine these different kinds of things that we can make, we can make events, we can make things, objects, we can make infrastructures like the world financial system. We can also make concepts and also ways to think about stuff, ways to, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, understand or to, to uh, create something. Design is a good example, right? So can we somehow blend together, join together what is, has become split apart, right? Not just for the last 400 years, but perhaps since Plato split apart poetry from philosophy. So, so I'll start this today with some questions. Like I said before, one question is what, instead of thinking of ourselves as makers, just making things, right? Uh, can we think about um, uh, people who create conditions, change the conditions under which other people make things or ask questions? Another one would be, another question would be, what are some questions that we can ask that, or propositions we can propose, you know, what if? that are worth doing, that are so um, vital and so, um, so of so much, so much vital concern for so many people and for the planet, that's not something that I can do by myself, that it must be done jointly. Are there such propositions? Okay, what are those propositions that need to be explored jointly, collectively? Okay. Uh, and that's what I'll just end with this uh, little image. Maybe uh, can we somehow now, uh, do the inverse of what Isaac Newton did. Can we, do, can we take these, these spectra of multiple colors, right? Run them through some social forms. I call them ateliers, you can call them ecologies or villages. And out the other side, can we, can we, can we generate um, an approach, different approaches, I mean different kinds of tinted light, not pure white, but tinted light that can give us some insight into a given situation, some vital proposition, okay? I say tinted because it's not that, you know, we have everything represented uniformly. Some places, some situations is a bit more red, other places are a bit more blue, right? So, so that's the beauty of it, that maybe we can create these multiple ways of, of producing different kinds of tinted insights. That's my beginning, okay? I'll come back again. Beautiful. That's a, a wonderful uh, uh, movement with the variation of color on the question and, and the question of what questions we ask. Um, what do we need to pose as propositions? Um, what risks do we need to take? How do we form these ateliers, these villages, these um, uh, ecologies to bring us to, to uh, our, our next uh, um, uh, uh, colleague, Roger Molina, whom we're honored to have with us as one of the founders of Leonardo uh, and uh, dear, dear friends to the art science technology community. Roger, welcome. Um, okay, so uh, I'm assuming you can hear me, if not wave. Um, <laughs> well, if you can hear me, you can't wave. <laughs> uh, if you're not there, please speak up. Um, so um, I, I think my first uh, comment is to Xin Wei. Um, Newtonian, uh, Newton was really pretty stupid. He was blind. He didn't know that the electromagnetic spectrum went all the way from the longest radio waves to the shortest gamma rays, 
and he didn't know there were other radiations like gamma rays and neutrinos. So I think we need to update that metaphor. I do like this, your idea of inverting the prism and taking all the different colors and making a laser beam. <laughs> How appropriate for the Leonardo lasers. Uh, we can use that as a logo. Uh, and some of my Indian colleagues uh, this week were celebrating the Festival of Light uh, in India. And uh, I guess part of collective courage um, is getting out of Plato's cave, Diana. <laughs> you know, do we dare get out of Plato's cave together? And there are all kinds of monsters and horrible things and animals that growl and we're safe in our cave on Zoom. Um, let me also just continue before I share my slides. I need to uh, correct the CEO. Uh, I think this is a private meeting, Diana, is that right? You're just wrong. I'm the astrophysicist here and your ecology stopped at the common boundary of the Earth's atmosphere. Isn't the fifth level our solar system? The sun varies, it changes us. Asteroids come and hit the Earth. You better add the solar system to your scheme of ecologies. I think we need to redefine what we mean by environment then, because if, the, if it is inclusive universally, then we're taken care of. But either way, well, but, but this, the sun is an unstable object. It gets brighter and dimmer. Uh, and so just like uh, smog and pollution reduces the, the solar uh, on, the, on the ground or heats up the atmosphere, the sun has a dominant influence on our ecology. Uh, I, do think, I think that our, I, I love the idea, Roger, that we can always add dimensions to our ecology. So maybe in, in recognizing the, the uh, dimensions of an ecology of courage, we could move to your slides that I know you're eager to share. Okay, before that, uh, do that, I just wanted to say to someone who may or may not be in the audience, Noah Broche, who, uh, when I knew him and I was the director of the observatory in Provence, he was the director of, I think, the Tel Aviv Observatory. And we were working on a telescope to be launched on a Russian satellite. And we failed. It never got launched after six years of working. But with uh, NOAA, we, uh, among other things, went around the south of France looking at prehistoric observatories. There are stone circles all over the south of France. They're usually buried now in apartment complexes and parking lots. But yeah. Uh, Cosmology is yet a bigger ecology. <laughs> and um, anyway, so I'm now going to share my slides just to get my narrative oops, uh, going. So share slides first. OK, you can probably see a screen. OK, so um, yes, uh, I'm a confused diasporic migrant. Uh, my first PhD was in astrophysics. Uh, and we worked with NASA and a lot of people, maybe uh, 600 people, to make a map of the sky. But three years ago, four years ago, I got a PhD in art at the Polytechnic University of Valencia in Spain. Huh. Boy, why didn't I get two PhDs at once? Why do we force young people to choose between a PhD in science or a PhD in art? Well, now I'm glad to say in the school I'm in, we give PhDs in art and science or PhDs in art and technology for professionals who combine different ways of knowing, of thinking, of doing, of enabling uh, Xinwei. <laughs> um, in the meantime, I've been an untrained editor for 35 years. I have no PhD in editing. I learned by doing. I think that's makerspaces, uh, Xinwei. So yes, um, I have had the motivation to change directions periodically. And um, I'm just going to click to the next slide. If there is a next slide, there is no next slide. Let me go again. <laughs> OK, so let's try again. OK, is it still there? OK, so um, Leonardo is asked. Um, and as I think both Diana and Xinwei said, uh, there's nothing new in what we're doing. There's been an eternal, eternal battle between the settlers and the migrants, or between the hunters and the gatherers. Huh. Ever since there were human beings, we argued. 
I'm also a geographic migrant. I've lived in France, England, America, Texas, which I think is in Mexico actually. Um, um, but right now it's in, in the USA. And unfortunately, it's the settlers who riot, write the biased histories that often ignore the migrants. And that is so true today that it's a little bit frightening. Um, if you don't speak the right language, you ignore the people who did amazing things in a different language. Scientists ignore the work of artists. It's patrons who pay historians to write biased histories that emphasize the success of their patronage. It takes courage to be a historian that respects the migrants, the diasporas, the people who don't know the one thing they wanna do in life. There's nothing new about these questions. So let me give you one example that just I've been working on in the last two weeks. One of my good friends in Texas is a Republican. He voted for the current US president but he's a judge, a sitting judge. And I met him because he used to work on the Apollo program right at the beginning. And he wrote a history of the American Apollo program. Now he's a judge and he's a sitting judge. So he still makes decisions that send people to jail. Huh. Where's the art, science and technology in the law? And he's been studying how the evidence produced by machines is disrupting and invalidating many legal processes. He sent people to jail uh, based on evidence that was techno evidence. And you can't cross examine the witness. Oh, did you check that too when you did someone's DNA? Oh, how hot was your DNA when you measured it? You know that means it might be a wrong measurement? How does a judge cross-examine a witness when the machine or the artificial intelligence won't reply to the judge's questions? And he has been devastated because he put people to jail based on techno evidence that proved to be wrong 20 years later. And the easy example is when you use DNA data to see if someone was at the scene of the crime. Well, the good news is the scientists do it better now. And sometimes they get a different result. And someone who was put in jail based on techno evidence had to be freed because no, the machine lied and it was never cross-examined and that person was never there. So what's he been doing now? And I'm about to turn it over to the other provocateurs. He has been presiding on, on trials using Zoom. Yes, you still got to send people to prison during the pandemic. No, you can't have all those people sharing germs in a courthouse. So they made him a fake chair to put behind him on Zoom. So he looked like a judge looking down at the witness. He's scandalized by the techno ignorance of lawyers and judges. I mean, they have no idea how easy it is you think I'm talking right now, don't you? No, I recorded this yesterday and I'm just playing it now. How do you know I'm alive? We published a book on tele-epistemology by Ken Goldberg, an engineer with Herbert Dreyfus, a philosopher. How do you know what's true at a distance? Tele-epistemology. How do you know if someone's whispering in the air of the witness wherein they're in the virtual courtroom and telling the witness what the right answer is? Huh. So what did I do? In my graduate seminar that I teach every Monday night, there was a theater student and he got so excited by the judge's problem. He's now working on theater stage designs to put on Zoom to create the impression you're in a courtroom that you can look people in the eyes, et cetera, et cetera. Who are the world's expert on court trials on Zoom? A young theater student. Uh, science and technology. That I've been talking and working on this for the last four weeks. Thank you. That was my little example. Thanks, Roger. You know, it, it, it 
that example really speaks to how uh, uh, revolutionary this time is. You know, the new technology, the new technology of um, uh, how we interact with each other is, is fundamentally changing. And we can look at that as artifice, we can look at that as art, but however we look at it, this is part of our ecology now. This is how we connect. So what does that open up for us? What might that create at this intersection of art, science, technology? How does that uh, initiate synthesis? of the way that we uh, connect with each other. I'm gonna turn um, back to Xin Wei and uh, give us a heads up that we have about 10 minutes left of sharing some examples and insights before we learn from our listeners the questions that will engage us for the remainder of our time. Okay, Xin Wei, thank you so much. Okay, so in that case, um, let me do this. I'm gonna share again some more images. I wanted to, um, quickly uh, just flash some slides to introduce some uh, amazing people who I've met. Diana, can you hear me and see the new slides? And can you all see the slides? I just wanted to check, can you see the slides? I could hmm. see it before, but now I can't. All right, so let me go back and make sure because this is, I really want to share this with people. Okay, I'll be right there. I know what you're gonna share and it's beautiful. Wait, wanna... Okay, so here we go. Tell me if you can hear, see this. Okay. Uh, let me see. Okay, all right, yes, good, okay. Uh, so uh, this is a group called uh, Du Tupin de Jeans. It's, uh, it's led by two choreographers, Annie Vigier and Franck Apete in, uh, in France, mostly working in Europe, in France. And for many, many years, they've been working as um, with, uh, with dancers and choreographers, but the, the kind of questions they, they ask uh, is not so much, it's not about making a particular work. They do make works, okay? They do make performance works, of course, but they're always asking about the frame, the conditions under which uh, an event, an artistic event happens. So since we don't have time, all I want to do is just draw your attention to this group and invite you to take a look at this group. They're, they've done some really provocative work, uh, both in places where you would not even see the work uh, ordinarily, because not framed that way in, in the outdoors, and as, as well as work in events such as Documenta and the Sons uh, Pompidou. Uh, another can group. Wait. Can yes. wait. Let, let me just jump in, if that's all right. Can you go back to that? So yes. one of the other projects I'm working on is a new emerging technology that artists are all using all the time now here in Dallas. It's called mobile brain imaging technologies can now wear a cap that monitors all your brain acti activity. And if you have epileptic seizure, seizures, it'll give you ahead of time a warning, you're about to have an epileptic seizure, stop driving, sit down, you're gonna have an accident. One of Great. the projects of my collaborator is to study dancers and what's going on in their brains when they're doing exactly that kind of project you presented. How do you have collective activity synchronized so that people don't fall over each other and often they're not looking at each other at all. So somehow we have collective activities like dancing and choreography and so on where we do synchronize brains in a jazz quintet in a scientific so, research lab. Okay, so here's what I'll bring and up. And the next stuff. step is collective courage. Okay, so here's what I'll bring up something else. Uh, one of the kinds of questions that these people ask is uh, not something that we can answer by looking at data coming from the bodies of the dancers or performers, or in fact, uh, uh, the, the data coming from any one person at all, but more in terms of the relationship between the event and the institution. 
Okay, so this is not new. I mean, so for example, right, so we're going back to Marcel Duchamp, for example, for now we have about 100 years of this kind of work. So they're more talking about the framing conditions, institutional framing conditions, that you, so you can't put a sensor on that directly in these other kinds of tools, for example, maybe looking at social, sociological um, uh, um, observations. So, so this is another group. Uh, this is another group called Laboratoire du Gest. Uh, it's led by Melanie Perrier and Barbara Formas was a philosopher. I let you listen to this. It's only two minutes or one minute. Can't hear, uh, not hearing it. Well, if we can't hear you, we can only see it. Can't hear it. That means that we will have to share again. We can lip read. Share. Share screen. Uh, we lost the image. I'll try again. Now tell me if you can hear okay? Uh, we're going to play it. I just explain the rules. En tout cas, ce corpus uh, est composé donc de... So for the first part of the game, documents. there are four tables that have on them documents that are works and citations. On a refait un corpus spécialement We have um, created a corpus especially around the theme of migration for today. Plusieurs étapes du jeu. Première étape. So, for the first stage, we're going to place um, words on the floor to create a schema. And we're going to choose um, pillar words or pedestal words. Autour de, ce, de ces piliers, du coup, around each of these pillar pardon, words, these placer, central words, uh, each team will join on citations uh, uh, and images. This activity is timed, and that's why there's a bell in the middle of the room. La première partie. Deuxième partie, on fait des liens. So in the second stage, we're going to materialize and visualize relationships, rapports, uh, and links between the different elements using Ribbon. So this is a workshop that's done over multiple years uh, uh, by a group of philosophers uh, from Goldsmiths, from Sydney, from University of Paris and Sorbonne, and ASU, my university, ASU. Uh, along with designers and choreographers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the point here of this workshop was to understand, to give designers, the students from the AUP, American University in Paris, a very different set of movement methodologies and theatrical methodologies to break down the arrogance of design, to think about how to approach the question of the crisis of immigration that was, and it still is, uh, haunting Europe uh, from the East to the West. So looking at the, the, the movement of people who have been come, who have been lost, lost their homeland as they travel through Europe. Uh, so this is another project, and it's a, it's more to introduce the group Laboratoire du Gest, who I highly recommend. They've been going for about fourteen years, and then uh, finally a group called Foam, uh, which is um, an art group. I, I could say, in a sense, it's kind of an anti-art group. Uh, and I'll just let you again. I'll just let them speak for themselves because Maya Kuzmanovic is far more articulate than I can be. Okay, so um, I come from Foam, Foam was right, um, which the way that we describe it, describe it is a network of small laboratories for what we call speculative culture. We borrowed this term from Bruce Sterling, who has been mentioned many times, and we describe it as a phenomenon where a diverse group of people from a range of disciplines and cultures makers and thinkers, educators and gardeners, live and work together to prototype and experiment with possible futures. Foam is like an archipelago of experiments in speculative culture, where groups of people tinker with different realities, or as we like to say, grow their own worlds, um, where some of our islands are rock hard and they become formal funded studios in Brussels, Amsterdam, Stockholm, and Kernau, while others are more like sandy walking islets, uh, appearing and disappearing with the flow of people, money, and resources. The worlds or realities that we grow um, are very diverse, uh, but they share three common characteristics. 
We cultivate things and phenomena that grow, evolve, decay and die or transform into something else. We have faith in the pliant nature of reality and we subscribe to the principles of grow your own and do it yourself. And we explore and create whole worlds, whole realities or total experiences. Please note my use of the plural realities. Um, in Foam's view, there, is never, there has never been one but many realities or as Robert Anton Wilson called them, reality tunnels. We can only change, improve, destroy or neglect our narrow local reality that we can perceive and live within. So let me pause here uh, because I, I, I have not moved on to talk about Synthesis Center where most, most of my work has been happening over the past six, seven years. Uh, but I do want to point out to these point to these friends and allies uh, because they're working in very different social, technical, institutional conditions than mine. Um, and I think of Maya and Nick along with this group of foam lits that have been around that have been has spread around the world over the last fifteen years as being among the most courageous of the uh, of the uh, unclassifiable uh, creative peoples that I've met in my career over the past thirty years because they've been living. Uh, in between, in the cracks between art, between art and the science. They don't classify themselves as art or science or design or engineering. They don't fit inside institutions or against institutions. They, 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 they work with institutions and organizations and they've begun to do work that's just beginning to be recognized as something that we vitally need in their con present conditions. If we have time, I'll go back to talk about synthesis, which is doing things like this in a more systematic way. But let me pass the baton back to you, Diana. Thank you, Shinwei. You know, I, I hope we will have time to talk about synthesis, perhaps in Q and A discussion. Uh, discussion. Um, it it is courageous to be unclassified, as uh, our colleague, my Nick, as Leonardo, as um, so many people presenting at Transmeet, and uh, inspiring us today. I'm struck by uh, the the courage of imagining and building whole worlds, futures and realities in the plural. And what that means for us uh, to move past the arrogance of design into the audacity of, uh, of courage, the audacity of imagination. So perhaps um, uh, uh, I'll be so audacious as to give Roger a few more minutes and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll turn to the larger conversation with the Q&A from, from participants. Roger, I'm, I'm passing the baton to you. Okay. I, uh, oops, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, can you see my slide? No. <laughs> uh, thank you. The machine would learn what I'm trying to do. <laughs> okay, let, let me just um, tell you what it what it says. Um, so um, somehow I just uh, got triggered by uh, Shen Wei's uh, discussion, um, which obviously he used the word migrants. Uh, to, uh, Diana talked about the risk of being unclassifiable. Um, I work with a lot of foreign students here at the University of Texas in Dallas and talk about courage. I have a student who flew into Dallas this summer in the middle of the pandemic, had never been here before, is locked up in his apartment taking classes online. He thinks he's in America, but how does he know? Another student, Angelica Martinez, is Mexican. She's a legal migrant in the United States. She has played computer games since the age of two on her primitive cell phone. You may not know, but one of the biggest growing industries in the pandemic are professional esports. That's computer game teams where they, players get paid a salary to play and compete online. We're now working with people in West Africa because the West African uh, esports industry is growing. 
obviously people in South Korea and India, it's a true international community of people who meet each other through esports or computer games. She's asking the question, huh, Roger, you're so interested in brain science. Maybe we could create some Leonardo training games that use the best brain science available to us. How could we play games? And Xin Wei, thank you for showing those examples. How could you play games to transform people culturally, to turn them from racists to generous includers? Beautiful. How could you teach a group people collective courage through a computer game that uses the best contemporary brain science? Like many people, I took the Harvard implicit bias tests online. And I'm afraid to tell you, when I ver react very quickly to a picture, I'm more racist than when I react slowly to a picture. Maybe it's because when I was a kid, the only black people I met in Paris were servants and waiters. They weren't- I mean, No, Roger, it's, it's so, it's so um, powerful to draw on where we come from, because I think to, uh, to create change, to cr imagine an ecology of courage, we start where we are. So we start where we are and where we are brings with us um, our, our biases, our uh, uh, hopes, um, uh, uh, and all of that feeds how we can and informs how we can teach empathy, how we can uh, cultivate collective courage and perhaps ask that fundamental question, how can we become more humane? How can we humanize this but future? It gets really difficult because human animals evolved. Darwinian evolution, I think is mostly correct where you compete with people who are not like you. <laughs> How do you create collective empathy when the human animal evolved over the millennia and the hundreds of millennia where the hunters were hunting each other? So how do you change our, the thinking of our brains? And here's an example. We all know the best method is the scientific method. Why does not U.S. president believe the science about the pandemic? Well, yes, Roger. Even though we we have these these um, uh, assumptions, some of which may be right, some of which may be wrong, um, we do know that um, uh, that that empathy matters. We know that science matters. We know that art matters. We know that listening matters. So I want to move us towards listening now to some of the questions that I know are awaiting us. Uh, and uh, knowing that you have so much more to share, I'm hopeful that that will come out in response to the questions and wanna be sure that we're leaving time for that. Uh, uh, we can um, uh, uh, continue for just a, a, another <laughs> moment before that. And there's been already a question to hear more about the synthesis um, work that uh, uh, Shin Wei has to share as well. So Roger, let me give you another minute to wrap up and then we can maybe invite some, some of uh, thoughts, some of Shinwei's thoughts and practice on uh, uh, synthesis and then more questions. Okay, so I'm just gonna wrap up with a personal testimony to Colin Sanderson, who I think is maybe listening right now, but by total coincidence, just before the session, he emailed me about something else. And I said yes to his idea. I have known him for a long time. He lives in Scotland, in the north of England. He has one of the biggest art science technology libraries on the planet. And when my father died in 1982, he was taking a train to Scotland. So somehow my brain connected Colin Sanderson, Scotland, my father's death when I became the editor. So that's what human brains are capable of. I don't think artificial intelligence can do that yet. Thank you, Diana. 
Shin Wei, can I um, have you follow follow um, that uh, 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 wonderful punctuation of uh, uh, Roger's remarks that uh, speaks to what we can and can't do with different kinds of intelligence, respecting artificial intelligence, but embracing the human, the humane, the organic. Okay, great. Let me try again then, see if this works. Um, okay, so um, I wanted to share a little bit. So sometimes it's courageous. I mean, we're, we're being serious here and uh, it's, it's we, okay, we can be, the modest witness, the serious citizen, we can be uh, useful, et cetera, et cetera. But sometimes it's very courageous, perhaps, or it's, it's, it's very difficult to actually um, take what is taken for granted and put things in play. So this idea of putting in play is not the same thing as doing games or being playful in a, in a naive way. But these are the kinds of, see to some of the kinds of things we've been putting in play at synthesis, um, all under, all under this, this, this aspiration of trying to find ways to enable others to find reasons to live. Uh, so to not take for granted what is a person, what is a meal, what's uh, infrastructure, even basic things like what's time, you know, or what is a laboratory. So some of the kinds of uh, uh, work we've been doing, I just want to show maybe three or four streams. And what I mean by stream is basically a set of questions or propositions that are really gripping and vital to a group of people specifically. And they have been group people from around the world who come together around some of these questions uh, and we host them. But these streams can run on and on. It's, it, instead of this kind of problem solving approach where we have a problem that's well posed, we solve it and we move on. It's more about questions that haunt us, that have been haunting us for maybe centuries or generations. So those are the questions that I think are really vital. So um, here's, there'll be a few and some will be playful. So one question is, what is an instrument? What can we use to articulate uh, the environment in such a way that we can actually express ourselves with each other the way we express ourselves with a voice, with a gesture, or with a music instrument. Let's see what happens with these ordinary objects. Underneath, there's quite a lot of signal processing going on in mathematical analysis, but we're using them to somehow create map uh, to revoice objects. So that, here, I'll just let you finish with this and they'll speak again. We're taking samples at audio rate, meaning 19,000 samples per second or 44.1 thousand samples per second. So instead of the usual click a button, play a file, you know, push this button or enter a field and you get some, some you know, stimulus response kind of work, uh, 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 interaction with the computer. We're looking at somehow just kind of looking at the very vibrations of the material and taking the vibrations and, and revoicing the vibrations. In other words, making a voice possible. Here's another project, taking the table and thinking of the table as a piece of, as, a, as a theatrical stage and then add, and calling forth different kinds of behaviors from the table. So the beginning table can just be showing an image. So we're projecting this onto the table. So you stand around the table, you can see it as, it, as you'll be watching some sort of canned images. We can go from the, uh, 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 um, the fantasy of a wave to the Arizona desert, from the Arizona desert, we can pass to a city. 
and then we can be able to flyovers of the city. This can work at any scale. We can work at the scale of a table, or as Diana herself has seen, we can take this to the scale of the entire, entire floor of a theatrical space, so you can walk yourself. But then in turn, we can take what is a passive surface into something which has more uh, dynamic behavior. In this case, the river is, is superposed on top of the, uh, uh, an urban landscape, a diagram of an urban landscape, and then we bring it to life. When we bring it to life, what is passive becomes mist, so that as you begin to move your hand over the table, or to move an object over the table, like so, what seems like just you know featureless white comes alive because it begins to move according to the physics of atmosphere. And this can move go on and on. I'll show you some more examples later on. At this point, it becomes a full-on. Um, real-time simulation are using the, the same systems that are used to model weather, temperature, pressure, humidity, uh, different kinds of atmospheric properties. But in this case, the table itself, now it becomes active as atmosphere so that you can actually uh, 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 play with it this way. So uh, as I said before, we can move this, we can work this at different scales so that we can actually now into the atmosphere, instead of looking at the at a picture of the atmosphere, you become weather, you become clouds. And as you become clouds, your motions uh, turn into the motions of clouds, the clouds motions become music. So let me stop there for now. Every time I, I encounter your work, Shinwei, and this kind of discussion, I'm reminded of how, how important it is to be playful, to ima be imaginative, to re, uh, uh, revive that, that instinct we have as children and sometimes too often lose along the way. And through art, science, technology can maybe resuscitate and, and revive so that we can see things in new light. We can see things in a new way. So we have a couple questions, I think. Um, and uh, I wanted to invite our colleague Tal to um, uh, pose a few questions and uh, we, can, we can take it from there. Tal, you're muted, oh, there. It's fascinating, thank you. Um, <laughs> yes, it, 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 because of your love, it's inspired by your love. <laughs> we have echoes here. Um, so um, everything you've, shown from your from lab is, is um, raising questions and my question to you now is is if you look back um, at the history of your lab at the history of the involvement of collaborations there um, can you pick a moment when you actually understood that something interesting is maturing there uh, what was the step between um, being a student and then being someone that is actually encouraging collaborations of others? Not art or science engineering, but more to pursue fundamental critical questions. Okay. Um, uh, philosophical questions, you know. So they were, so they, that's why, so that in essence, they were transversal to begin with, okay. They were, they were, they were disguised or, or clothed as art uh, and science engineering laboratories in order to get funding and to be supported, to have a place. But really 200 people have come from all these different areas to these labs and they were not always students. There are people who were, because I was a director and professor, I could decide who could, who could come in. I said, I made it possible for people who are not even matriculated to participate in the laboratories, okay? So this leveraging the institutional um, position to be able to make it more amorphous. Okay, now, but for what? So the questions would be something like, uh, how can we make an event where ordinary activities can become more meaningful, can become more symbolically charged to each other and to ourselves? That was the, that's an example of a question. It doesn't look like art or science or engineering per se. In fact, it's very hard to write a grant to do that. 
So along the way, we would publish articles once in a while using the usual routes. So student comes through, studies with us for one to three to five years or six years, become more and more mature, they get a degree, they become graduate students, they learn how to write papers, et cetera, in the different areas, whether it's engineering or design or art, et cetera. So they learn to uh, once in a while produce uh, whether a publication or paper or installation, something that looks like and functions and can be judged as something is a piece of in media art as a piece of philosophy, that's okay. It takes a long time for that to happen. It takes, them, takes a student maybe four to five to six years. And some have come back to become graduate students and some have come back as postdocs and some have gone into industry and they still keep on working with us. So what's happened over 20 years is a network of people who very loosely kind of know each other, et cetera, et cetera, and go on to other things, it's fine. Now, that's all, it's a steady state, okay? It's always changing. Always more people coming in, leaving people coming in. Recently though, in the last three, four years, credit to ASU, all right? Arizona State University is the next phase. Okay, now that there's a small set of examples of this kind of way of living and working together, a lot of them want to come back, but they can't come back because they have to move on in life, right? So now we're looking at how can we actually find the different pods or villages out there. Uh, we're beginning to get inquiries from, um, from entities outside the art science spectrum, like the United Nations, for example, or school in autism, for example. All right, thanks to Leonardo, we'll see what we can do. But to ASU, but no longer, it now exceeds the boundary of what constitutes art science. And this is what I think is so exciting about Leonardo with Diana coming in now, right? Is that it's possible for us to begin to build on what's been done for the first 50 years, right? To see, can we now even put away that the, the classical conventions of art and science? It's just, just, we don't have to use those frames anymore. There's a scaffolding, but can we now address questions that are um, more transversal to begin with, like mortality or um, non-anthropocentric ways of making worlds that they're not just can I, uh, Tal, can I give you a slightly different answer to your question? Um, I, I, I can think of a moment where something changed uh, and, and that, you know, it's a general thing that when you change context, the same thing is different. Um, I had a student in our lab who was fascinated. He was basically a music student, but he needed to get a job. So he did a lot of programming. Um, and he, would, he, he was part of our data certification. We would convert data to sound. And one day, a biochemistry professor happened to walk into our lab, and he works on drug delivery for cancer patients. And guess what happened? He uses bioluminescent bacteria to deliver drugs into the cancer in a human body. When the uh, bacteria gets there, he shines a laser on it, and it releases the drug only in the cancer and nowhere else in the body. So what did this music student do? He sonified bioluminescent bacteria into sound so you knew where it was if you couldn't see it. <laughs> um, and at one point, um, the biochemist said, oh, I keep having to feed the bacteria in my Petri dishes, they run out of food. Why can't they, why can't they tell me when they're hungry? And what did the student do, Rithid Kaikini? He sonified bacteria colonies that were bioluminescent. And when they would, would became hungry and started dying, they'd start making sounds. And then the scientist could go feed them and then use them in his cancer experiments. Now, now if you think you could make that happen, I mean, it happened because we, like Shinwei said, we have a place where it can happen. <laughs> where the biochemist professor treating cancer meets the young music graduate student and they end up inventing something that's useful for treating cancers. And it was not by design. And yes, a lot of experiments fail, but let me tell you, he's telling that story all his career, how his skills as a musician helped uh, cure cancer. We're gonna have to jump in there to um, wrap up. But um, what I love about that, that final example and Shinwei's story and the questions themselves is that this transformation, this creative transformation across disciplines, these artificial boundaries, it, it, it happens when, we, when we're at that interface, when we're at that intersection, that interconnection. That can happen with transmeet. That can happen with 
these lasers, including the new laser, Tel Aviv. It happens with Leonardo. It happens when we open ourselves to courage, to build an ecology of courage. So uh, uh, for me, in part, that happens when we listen and when we lead with our heart and open with gratitude. So I wanna say thank you to our hosts for inviting us today, to Roger and Shin Wei. I wanna thank myself, we should put ourselves on the list, and to the thousands of people who registered to participate. Please keep showing up. We really need each other right now. We really make a difference. You matter, and this matters. Thank you so much for sharing this uh, laser with us. <laughs>